Hi, it's Jack from the MMA Island Podcast. Before this video gets started, before you listen to the podcast, big shout out to our sponsors, BetUS. If you are going to place a bet on MMA, basically any sport, do it through them. Their, their program is so great. They have everything that you would need to make a bet, to, to look at the bet, the props, everything there. If you want to do a parlay, it's there. Please go through BetUS. The link is in our description, in our bio. It'll be on Instagram. You can find it everywhere. BetUS, big shout out to our sponsor. I'm Jack Kennedy, and they hit a lot harder in my opinion too. What is up everybody, my name is Caelan McNamara, and everyone's got a plan until they get hit with my views. I am Hunter Boss, he just wanted to go to the distance by the looks of it, but he couldn't even do that. And this is the MMA Island Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MMA Island Podcast. I am Jack Kennedy alongside Keila McNamara and Hunter Boss. Today, we have another special guest joining us, Lorenzo Cole. Lorenzo is a recording artist and producer and a current BJJ practitioner. Lorenzo, thank you so much for joining us. What's up, man? How are y'all? Thanks for having me. Of course. So before we get going, talk to us about your music and, and, and everything like that. Shout it out. Tell people where to find it. Man, uh, I actually just wrapped up a new album. I've been working on it between Nashville and Florida. Um, yeah, I've got some good features on it. Got a lot of good stuff going, opening up a studio down here. Um, I'm on all platforms, so just trying to get out there and get some work going. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. So for this podcast, we have some great topics to go over. Giga Chikate, Edson Barbosa, the main event. We knew it would, would deliver. Oh. It did deliver. Keelan's favorite topic of the day, Jake Paul versus Tywin Woodley. We're going to be talking oh, about that. Right. I'm just going to log out. <laughs> and to end it off, we're going to be discussing some Kevin Lee. Can he come back and what, what you know, the aftermath will be after his loss to Daniel Rodriguez. So let's go ahead and get it started. Giga Chikadze, Edson Barbosa, Lorenzo, what'd you make of this main event? Man, it was action packed for sure, man. You know, when the first round came out, I thought Edson was doing good. He kind of was backing him up a little bit, keeping on him good. You know, I thought right off the bat, you know, I thought Edson had the advantage with the hands going into it. Um, but I gave Giga, like, I gave him the advantage as far as, like, kicks and just maybe just a little bit more creativity, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, yeah, after that first round, you know, it was pretty good. But then it just shifted, man. I mean, Giga started backing him up, you know. Um, Edson had the leg kick in there. But, you know, I think Giga really took control in the second and just put him out, man, so – yeah, no, it was an awesome fight. Let's just say yep. I'm going to put that out there right now. It was super back and forth, and it was a really good, like, you didn't really know who had the edge at sometimes, you know. At the first round, you're thinking, oh, maybe Edson Barbeau's got the edge, and then Giga Chikadze had the edge, and it just kept going back and forth. And something that surprised me about this fight, it looked like Giga Chikadze was kind of fading come round two, round, like halfway through yeah. round two. I wasn't yeah. expecting that. I was thinking maybe Edson Barboza would start to fade. But mm -hmm. Giga Chikadze, he was breathing heavy through his mouth, and Good thing he closed it down in the third round because if they went into the fourth and fifth round, I don't know how good he would have lasted there. So that's yeah. gonna that's a new hole we see in Giga Chikadze's game, I'd say, is his cardio and, and his stamina. But when he puts on a pace like that, like he did on, on Saturday night, anyone's cardio would be shot by then. So yeah, think as you will, uh, Giga Chikadze, fantastic performance. I loved his combinations. I loved Edson Barboza's combinations. You really hate to see someone lose in this fight, but – Giga Chikadze did a fantastic job in his call-out game. Once again, Max Holloway, are we going to see it? Probably not, but it would be an amazing fight to see eventually down the road. Yeah. Yeah, man, um, I got to kick this point off by saying what a hell of a fight. Let me just say both guys, absolute fireworks from the beginning. We expected nothing less than we got nothing less. Um, I got to kick this off with my boy Lorenzo's point because it's a point I really agree with. Edson Barbosa's ring generalship or octagon generalship, I should say, was perfect in the first round. Took took control of the center really well. Used that orthodox stance very well. You know, got Giga backing up, which he isn't terribly used to doing, and really did. He really was very good with his hands. Giga came out with a lot of excellent variety in his strikes, you know, throwing axe kicks, throwing those shots to the body that we know. And I think that's probably why Giga edged round one, even though he was getting backed up most of the time. 
But as Lorenzo said, and again, I got to agree with him, completely flipped the script in round two, came out, took control. One thing that we know about Edson Barbosa throughout his career is that he does not like being backed up. As a very traditional Muay Thai kickboxer, he likes having space to throw his shots, especially his big kicks. Giga backing him up, he doesn't give him an inch to use that. He completely swallows all that space that he likes using, and he used it to absolute perfect effect. Moreover, started landing that infamous Giga kick to the body, to the liver, and really started to slow Edson down a little bit. His shots were very accurate to the head and to the legs too. Edson was never out of it, but Giga definitely did start to take control from really the end of round two onwards. That being said, I very much do agree with what Hunter said, and I'm grateful he picked it up because Edson really was starting to get to Giga's gas tank. Edson... Edson knew that he would most likely be backed up, so he knew he had to be very surgical with his strikes. So what he what he was obviously doing was very um, sophisticated and very well-timed hooks to the body to slow down Giga, and it was starting to work to some effect. Unfortunately for Edson, though, Giga was just too powerful and too accurate. That shot coming off of the single leg grab straight into the cheek floored Edson and he was wobbled for a good two or three minutes up until the end of the fight from there. So credit to Giga Jakadze, definitely came through his toughest test so far. Edson's still one of the top featherweights in the world. His stock, I really don't think, was down much from here. But Giga's a very real threat to the rest of 145. There is no question about that. Oh, yeah. Hey, I have to agree with you guys. I mean, this fight was there's a reason we were hyping it up so much because it was going to deliver. There was no way it wasn't going to deliver. And it absolutely did. It was just fascinating to watch such technical strikers, but they were so deadly and could finish anybody any moment. Go at it. What was fascinating, one of the things I said that were going to be the key factors in this fight were the leg kicks and the boxing. Now, I thought particularly from Edson Barbosa, and now Barbosa had some really good leg kicks where he caught Chikadze, who, who plants heavy on his league leg and a lot of the times to set up his kicks. He caught him with some good calf kicks. And Giga, you, he, he has a good poker face, but you could tell those landed. Um, but man, I mean, Giga Chikadze is legit. I, I, I love that he's calling out Max Holloway and then he's calling out these these big fighters and everything, calling out, you know, I want to be a backup for the main event, called out uh, for a Max Holloway fight. But you guys picked up on it. That gas tank is going to become an issue for Giga Jakadze. And if he fights Max Holloway, it's the same reason why Yair Rodriguez wouldn't stand a chance against Max Holloway is because they would gas out trying to put Max Holloway away in the first two rounds. Max Holloway has fought Dustin Poirier at 155, ate his best shots, and did not even get dropped one time. Hasn't been dropped throughout his entire career. I don't know if anyone can finish Max Holloway on the feet at this point. So you're going to... Put your best shots out there, and then th- rounds three, four, and five, Max Holloway will put on his relentless pressure and pace and, and finish you. That's where I just kind of think about it. But honestly, I thought Giga fought really well, and I do think Giga can go all five rounds. Round three, round two, he looked really slow to me. Um, round two was very competitive, but I thought Edson Barbosa was looking really good because Giga was slowing down. Round three, Giga kind of switched his style up a little bit, went away from the super heavy kicks and more towards the boxing. Obviously, we saw him catch Edson Barbosa so good. And um, I, I think the way that Edson Barbosa fights so well at 145, but I think the recovery is going to take a factor because of the weight cut, which is why I think he was able to not not recover super well against Giga Chikadze. Also because Giga Chikadze is just insane and the shots would knock out pretty much anybody. So I, I don't know. It's very interesting. I think he he noticed and switched up his style a little bit in the third round. So I think he could go that style for rounds three, four, and five. And I think it could work against maybe like a Calvin Cater, uh, Yair Rodriguez, maybe a Chan Sung Jung. But if you're fighting a guy like I would say Volkanovsky or Max Holloway, I just don't know that gas tank won't hold up against high pressure guys like that, but just phenomenal fight. Just like you guys said, massive credit to Edson Barbosa. He always brings it. He was not at any point in this fight completely out of it. Um, he put on a show and it was just, it was really great to watch. So now moving on to our sep- second topic today, right? This was the fight Sunday, the big boxing fight. We have to talk about it, Keelan, because it does have an MMA fighter in it or former MMA fighter at that Tyron Woodley versus Jake Paul. Lorenzo, what'd you make of this? I mean, I had Jake Paul winning almost every round, but maybe two rounds yeah. in that fight. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of – it was weird, man. It was just a weird thing to watch, a weird thing to experience, you know. But uh, I got to give props to Jake, to be honest, man. He's a smart businessman, and he uh, he really did better than I thought he would, really. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, you know, there's something different I saw about this fight than I've seen for all of Jake Paul's last fights. Because trust me, I've watched all of them, Keelan. And <laughs> the main difference I saw was in the walkout. You know, Jake Paul looked nervous going into, <laughs> into that ring. I haven't seen him nervous. He wasn't nervous against Ben Askren. He wasn't nervous against uh, Nate Robinson. And he walks out against Tyron Woodley. He looked nervous. And I instantly thought, man, us MMA fans, we might have a chance this fight. Tyron Woodley can get it done. And he did really – I think I, the rounds I had for Tyron Woodley, I had round three for Tyron Woodley. I had round four for Tyron Woodley. And I had round eight for Tyron Woodley. But he just didn't do enough. He was a lot – he's very trigger shy when it came down to it. Uh, he almost finished him back, back in the fourth round. It was close. And it's definitely the most significant strike of the match. Uh, so at least we've come this far. But I got to give props where props is due. Jake Paul did a fantastic job. And he's honestly, he's shaping out to be a decent boxer right now. Don't get me wrong. He's, he's no Muhammad Ali yet, but he's, he's put in the work and he's done. He's done. He's done everything he needs to do. And he's going out there and he's looking, he's, and he's fighting smart too. He's a big guy. He's taller than Tyler Woodley. He used his reach to his advantage. It wasn't a terrible fight in that matter. You know, I don't love the YouTube fighting matches, but this was definitely the best one by far. Man, I don't even know what more I can say at this point. Um, I'm, I'm just being dragged through the trench of emotions, like raging from anywhere from unadulterated rage to sheer sadness at the state that boxing's come that we're even talking about this. But being professionals, we got to talk about it, I guess, reluctantly still. Um, yeah, it's still a freak show circus to me. So I can't break it down in the way that I would break down a Giga Chikadze at some Barbosa fight because it is a circus. So you have to mark a circus by circus standards. Um, I do have to say, though, Hunter's right. Jake looked nervous, and rightly so, for once he finally fought someone who'd actually knocked someone out for once. So we're making progress, I guess. Um, but in terms of the actual fight itself, bit bland, bit lackluster for me. Jake... Um, Jacob did what Jacob had to do, I guess. You know, wrapped up Tyron in the clinch when he had to, used his job, so on and so forth. Tyron was very unimaginative, as he's always been with the striking. You know, jab, jab, shot, jab, jab, shot against the gloves. Same combo he's always thrown, same combo he used in the ring. That being said, um, he very nearly flatlined him with one right hand that did actually make it through the guard. And if that if those ropes have been even half a yard longer in either direction, he's on the canvas and it's a knockdown. Quite frankly, I would argue it still should have been a knockdown because he was he looked punch drunk after that shot. He was hurt and his brains got scrambled quite badly. Not that I'm one for conspiracy theories because I hate pushing conspiracy theories, but one would wonder why Tyron didn't pursue the knockout after that shot. Now, either he was gun shy and he froze for two seconds after seeing Jake hanging on for dear life against the ropes, or he simply didn't want to. Now, read into that whatever you will. I'm not going to push that narrative one way or the other, but I think there's something there that needs to be asked at the very least. Um, so yeah, pretty unimaginative fight from my perspective. Jake probably did enough to get the decision, I would argue, maybe. But um, yeah, I mean, look, my my interest is never going to be as much in this as Barbosa Chikadze. I'm not going to lie to the people. You can probably tell from my tone of voice and everything else. But yeah, I'm just, I really don't want to see any more of this. And I know there's going to be more of this. And I'm going to have to talk about it again and again and again. And I'm going to have to keep breaking it down and keep talking about this and keep talking about that. But yeah, it it was the spectacle that it was. The only real positive for me in the night was Dynamite Daniel Dubois. Very good heavyweight from the UK. Violent first round knockout. Guy could be a future world champion. And even, I know this wasn't necessarily the question, but even on the undercard, incredibly unimpressed with Tommy Fury, who's meant to be fighting this bum next. You know, fighting Anthony Taylor, Jake's homeboy sparring partner, had a five or six inch reach advantage over him, five or six inch height advantage and still couldn't put him away, and he only fought him over four rounds. I just think both of these sides are as bad as each other. I think it's all a massive joke. 
And if Jake Paul is retired, then for the love of God, I hope it stays that way. But we know it's going to be a Conor McGregor retirement where he's back again and again and again. And that's to quote Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's all I got to say about that. Come on, Keelan. We all know you love to talk about that. We all we all know you're all about that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes, also, if you couldn't tell. Yeah, exactly. Also, I want to touch on Hunter said Jake Paul is not Muhammad Ali yet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. He's, he's getting there. He's not, <laughs> Muhammad Ali's not to Jake Paul yet. That's what I meant, you know? <laughs> oh, Jake of course. Paul is so good. Of course. The of rematch course, will yeah. tell all. The rematch will tell all. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's a circus. It always is. I, I was worried for Jake Paul with the electric, uh, you know, thing where it has his name spinning around on his shorts the entire time. Like, if he did get knocked out. That was that, awesome. Like, I got to say, those are That was pretty cool. I, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Modern technology for boxing as well. Jake Paul's bringing out all, all the new stuff for sure. <laughs> but um, I don't know. It was interesting. Uh, Tyron Woodley. See, uh, that point about him possibly like, you know, the, the conspiracy thing, obviously, right? That's in any Jake Paul boxing fight. I think it will be because of just who yeah. he is and who he's fighting, right? The problem is, though, I would believe it against anybody else. But what we've seen from Tyron Woodley in this last three, four fights is exactly that where he is gun shy, even though he might've had him hurt. He might've been like, okay, if I rush in, I might get finished because he just got caught by Vicente Luque in his last fight too. So that's the problem I have with that because Tyron Woodley has been known. And that's one of the problems is the most of the fight, he was just kind of standing there and waiting to land like a, a shot, but then he would throw it and then kind of, you know, go back and just stand there, which is what was kind of frustrating about it. Whenever he landed that shot, I was like, Oh, please let him finish it. But he didn't do it. And that was it. Um, and yeah, I mean, Jake Paul won. I mean, if, if we're being realistic, he won uh, the rounds. I mean, they weren't even really that close. He was just he would land maybe one, two combinations per round, and that would be enough to win it. But Tyron really wasn't really offering anything offensively. Um, I probably offer. I probably agree with you, Hunter. Maybe I, I would. I probably had Jake Paul round three as well. Round four, definitely Tyron Woodley when you rocked him. Uh, that was like the only obvious round Tyron won for me. Uh, and then round eight, I would probably give to Tyron Woodley as well because Jake Paul was just exhausted. Round yeah. six through eight, he was exhausted. I really think after round four, Tyron, if he went all out, I think he could have finished him. I, I really do. Yeah. He's just too gun shy, which is what's upsetting about it. But that's also why Jake Paul chooses him. I mean, think about it. I, he, he chose a guy that has knockout power, right? But it's not a good boxer. Yeah. Tyron exactly. Woodley is yeah. not a good boxer. Um, and, and that was evident again. Now, he rocked him because he has knockout power. But when, when you come down to it, it's the same reason why, you know, he chose Ben Askren. He could say, oh, I beat an MMA fighter, a good MMA fighter. Well, Ben Askren, I mean, search up Ben Askren versus Damian Maya if you want to know anything about, you know, Ben Askren striking in, in MMA. Um, but, yeah, I, I agree with pretty much everything you guys said. So a little bit of a side topic here, but it's connected to this. A tweet came out just like 10 minutes ago. Jake Paul saying that he is like, you know, n- new type. He's a retired boxer. Lorenzo, what do you think about that? Um, I mean, it's just, he's just trying to build up something more. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. I think he needs at this point, you know, he's beat Woodley, he's beat Askren, you know, he needs, uh, he needs people calling his name, you know, so he just needs to see who's next. You know what I mean? He's yeah. just kind of observing the field, you know, he's taking a step back and, uh, he's probably got tons of other things going on. So I think he's just going to see who makes the most sense and, you know, he's gonna have another huge fight. Yeah. No, if, if the tweet is true, I think it's time to crack out the proper 12 and start celebrating, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's a party. That's what I say. Uh, if it truly is the end of these YouTube boxing matches, we can uh, go back to real life, per se, you know, where we can where we can get excited about the Gigi Chikadze fight that happened last week and not get excited for the Jake Paul fight that's happening. You know, it's, 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 it's a different scenario, and I think boxing will just be better and all. If Jake Paul's out of it for now on, I think he did what he needed to do. He got the viewers looking at some boxers in the preliminary preliminary cards, which is always good to have more eyes on boxing because they are truly dying right now. So for him to do what he did there, it's smart for him. It's smart for boxing, I would say. I know Keelan dis- disagrees. I'm waiting for it. But uh, <laughs> just I, think, like- I think good, bad publicity, it's all publicity. So good for boxing. <laughs> Uh, Jake Paul, you did what you, you had to do. You made a bunch of money off of it. Congratulations. Uh, you played us all. Fantastic job. And uh, hopefully you stay retired in the, in the most sincere way. Am I the only person that's saying this differently to everyone else? <laughs> you know, congratulations. You, who did he play? 
Dude, he and played he us all. Up. He took everyone's money. What are you talking about? He took us all. He didn't take yeah. me. Hunter, he please tell me you did not pay for that. Sorry. Please tell me you didn't pay for that. Hunter, if you paid for that, we're going to have to seriously reevaluate. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're not talking about what happened if, and how I watched it, okay? That, that wasn't the question. <laughs> you got to think, too, I plead the though, fifth like, on this one, all right? You got to think, too, like, how sad is it that, like, when you think of boxing, the first thing you think of isn't like any world champion. You just think oh, of the Paul brothers. You know what that's I mean? It. Exactly. That's, that's what's yeah. happening now. That's it. Well, yeah. I, don't, I don't even know what to say anymore. Um, <laughs> it, this has just been a complete delusion from day one. You know, ever since KSI and Joe Weller, people don't know how this started. It started with them. They fought in the Copper Box Arena in London and it's ended up where the hell we are now. Basically a rabbit hole three, four years down the line. Look, I mean, if I'm being totally, I have a lot of emotion about this because I love boxing. I've always been a boxing fan. But if I'm taking the emotion out of it and I'm being completely fair, you know, for those of us old enough to remember, because we were all a fan at some point of the WWF slash E, Eric Bischoff once said, controversy creates cash. And whether you love him, whether you despise him, Jake Paul did what he needed to do. He's made a criminal amount of money out of this off of criminally gullible people so in the most base tasteless way possible hats off to him i guess but you know if you really fell for this and if you really believe that jake paul gives a toss about anybody but jake paul then quite frankly he deserves to rob you because you're stupid enough to play into his game and you're stupid enough to give him the money that he wants you may as well just throw the money at him and say take it take it take it because this is absolutely insane. If you think Jake Paul is losing any amount of sleep over the state of fighter pay in the UFC, you are mental. Because he doesn't care. He doesn't care about you, 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 or you. Jake Paul cares about the person he's only ever cared about, and that's Jake Paul. Please. Jake Paul doesn't care about who he oh, asks man, to stand on or trod over to get still going. Off. He will go through anything or anyone to get what he wants. Same for Logan, quite frankly. And one thing that really got to me with the press conference as well is, is that, you know, Amanda Serrano, very good female boxer, put her as the co-main event. If you think he cares about gender disparities and paying combat sports, you are equally as mental. He cares about headlines. He cares about money. He cares about publicity. Do you really think Jake Paul gives a damn about Amanda Serrano and how much money she's making? No, he does not. And you see this baiting out of, oh, it's nice to see women's boxing's finally being recognized. Katie Taylor and Clarissa Shields have been doing that for the last five years. Where were you? I'm I'm fed up with this. I really am. It's starting to, on a deep level, it's starting to get to me. Because Katie Taylor has been an amazing role model for women's boxing for five years Clarissa Shields, two-division female world champion for four or five years. So this absolute BS that Jake Paul is somehow the champion of gender disparity and fighter disparity in combat sports is absolutely beyond the real. It's just an absolute world of madness. And quite frankly, if you're part of the people that are gullible enough to believe this tool, then you deserve to get robbed and you deserve to say that you felt robbed because you did get robbed. It was a legitimate professional robbery that this that you buy into all of this. Jake Paul is a rent boy Floyd Mayweather. He's picking opponents he knows will never beat him. He knows he can beat them because they're not boxers. Put him in with a half-decent amateur even in, even a WBO continental world champion, and they will beat the brakes off him. He was exhausted after eight rounds with a guy who isn't a boxer. What the hell do you think someone who knows what they're doing is going to do to him? You know, that, that's all I'm going to say about this because I'll end up saying something I regret, but you guys know what I have to say about that, and I could keep going, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to risk an aneurysm. I have too much to live for. I think uh, we found Jake Paul's next opponent, though. Yeah, I think we right? need to start. that's yeah. the scene. That's the scene. You know what? Right there. I don't give a shit anymore. I'll do it. <laughs> Let me tell you what. Yet another legendary Keelan Jake Paul uh, 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 section. I mean, it's just. <laughs> Am I wrong though? Am no, I, I wrong though? Look, I, 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 I can't disagree with you. 
I mean, how do I follow that up now? I mean, I'm not gonna. Like, I I just gotta sit back. I'll, on I'll disagree a little bit with Keelan. I'm not gonna lie here. All right, let's go. Let's go. When, 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 when it first it. came down to it, honestly, I don't follow boxing. So when I saw Amanda fight that night, I thought, man, she's a fantastic boxer. And now I know her. This Fair is enough. because I know her because of this is through Jake Paul. Jake Paul is indirectly helping fighters out here, and I'm gonna put that out there right now. Even if he doesn't care about fighter pay, he's making his followers show that he does. And his followers are now caring about fighter pay. I mean, he's mm. starting a chain reaction here. If you don't like the guy, fine. You don't like the guy. But he is doing good things for this right now. As much as you hate to say it, because when you think of boxing, you not think of him. That's a terrible thing, I know. But in a year or two, when he's out of this uh, boxing phase, it's going to end up with better results than it is right now. We're just in the – it's always darkest before dawn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put it at that. Yeah, but how long does the darkness last here, Hunter? Mm. Not too long. He just tweeted out he retired. That's we'll what see. this whole thing's about. Yeah. In, in, in the ring, he's like, I don't know. I think I might take a break. I'm only 24, and I honestly believe him. But I, I don't think he can grab too many more cash grabs because that Tyrone Woodley fight was the hardest fight for his career, and I don't, I don't think he wants to do that again. I honestly don't think so. He's not a fighter, like you said, Kula. He's not. He's a businessman. He made his money. He's getting out. Yeah, man, I agree. With, I actually agree with Hunter. So I agree with both of you, right? You're both right. Keelan got it halfway there and then Hunter brought it home because I guess kill Keelan. <laughs> <laughs> Keelan's blocking off now. Yeah. <laughs> no, but Hunter, I mean, you're right. I, it's Keelan's right. in the fact that he doesn't care about it. I mean, it's very clearly he went in and, and he is trying to win some MMA fans or not. He's not trying to win the MMA fan. He's, he's trying to win a quarter of an MMA fan by trying to say, okay, I'm out there. Look, okay. I'm finding your guys. I'm making fun of your guys, but it's an act. And I want, you know, I want fire pay. Does he really care about it? No, Keelan, you're right. But Hunter, you're also right in the fact where it's like, oh, all these celebrity people that know Jake Paul that are watching these fights are like, oh yeah, why are they getting paid so low? Why does this person have to start up a GoFundMe page after after finding the UFC? Why, why is that a thing? So I think it is influential. And I think it is, you know, doing the right thing, just like Hunter said, as hard as it is to say. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just for him. I mean, for him to retire, I, I think, I think this might be actually legit because he got rocked. Like he got rocked against Tyrone Woodley. It was one punch and he got hurt really bad. And then I think he realizes, okay, it's going to be, it has to be a step up every time now. Right. I mean, even though it is, it is, you know, he's most likely supposed to win Ben Askren to Tyrone Woodley is a step up, you know, uh, Nate Robinson to Ben Askren is a step up. He can't go back down now and fight someone else that no one's ever heard of. He has to keep going and keep going, get bigger names. So after being rocked like that, he might be like, okay, I can retire undefeated. I can retire on top as such. It would a be in his hometown, nonetheless. He would exactly. be retiring in his yeah. hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. A, a top pay-per-view. Everyone's still talking about him. I mean, even we're talking about him because he fought an MMA guy. Um, I mean, that would be uh, that would be the way to go. He might do one like down the road in the future, just as like a, another random thing. But for the foreseeable future, I think that he might actually be done. And just like Hunter said, it's time to celebrate if you're Jake Paul because mission accomplished. I mean, you got out there undefeated and you beat you you legitimately beat these guys. Now, granted, it's in boxing and everybody's gonna be like, oh, you should have gone to MMA. But he did this thing and he got everybody talking about him. He got his all, all of his money. And um, I mean, he's gonna go down as a boxer. Yeah, Keelan, what's up? Guys, I'm not done. Here we go. I have, I have a couple right. more things I need to say. I got to get this off my chest while we're at it. Yeah. You know who I actually blame the most for this rotten, dismal situation we find ourselves in, where influencers are changing the course of the world. And then I thought of when you first think of boxing, as Lorenzo said, I blame boxing. I blame the WBC, the WBA, the WBO, and the IBF for leading us into this hell of a rabbit hole corruption 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 not making the fights people wanted to see charging insane amounts of money for pay-per-view events especially to my brothers in the states is just absolutely beyond insanity it's a big turnoff especially if you're not into boxing i yeah. I, I just gotta i gotta interject there because like i was like even just like you know i was looking at watching like a canelo fight not the most recent one but but a while ago and it's just like especially if i'm not into boxing the, the price is just like ah. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm yeah. not going to pay that way, way too much. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, quite frankly, what the, what boxing did, boxing can sit on its ass and complain all at once about the situation that's going on, but they're the culprits for this. They created yeah. the power vacuum that let a tool bag like Jake Paul pick up the mantle and start making the money that he did. Again, quite frankly, I don't like the guy. I think he's making a joke of an amazing sport. You guys know my views on this, yeah. but you know what? 
He snuck in and he stole the bag whenever no one else was looking and boxing didn't have the guts to clean it up. So on again, on a base level, I almost kind of have to respect him for it because someone was going to do it, I guess. And he probably thought, why not him? My second point is this. And it's a point that is really starting to get to me. I know I made it already, but I'm going to expand a little on it now. And it's on fighter pay, which I know is a very controversial issue. And you guys are going to be really amazed at what I'm about to say, because I'm going to defend someone you, you'd never think I'd defend again. And I have to wheel out the example of Conor McGregor. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, fair enough. So, yeah. Basically, you know, you know my views on Conor McGregor, especially where I'm from and the nature of the fan that I am being Irish. But we, in 2021, we live in an era of fighting now where the most dull, bland, boring people all see Conor McGregor and all think they're entitled to yachts and mansions and Bentleys and so on and so forth, list whatever you want. What people conveniently fail to forget is what Connor did to get all of this and to become the face that he did. Let's not forget, Connor came into the UFC not in a great financial situation, albeit a two weight cage warriors champion. Connor McGregor fought down near every other month in 2014 and 2015 yeah. and got bonus checks every single fight that he fought. You know, Brimage, Brando. Um, Dennis Seaver, Poirier, Holloway. I mean, mm -hmm. I could go on and on and on and on. And it's really starting to irritate me now because, look, Dana White is far, far from the perfect boss. I'm never going to defend him in his entirety because nobody's perfect. But I'm, I'm really starting to get ticked off with people ganging up on him and fighter pay now because you've got these people content to take boring decisions and then think they have this right <laughs> to you know, two, three hundred K a fight. No, that's not how it works. I don't know where these people think they get their moral high horse from and demanding 300 K a fight. If you want to look at the example of Conor McGregor and look at what he boasts and look at what he flashes, I ain't defending the guy, but look at what he went through and look at what he put in to put in the work to become the face that runs the place or used to run the place. There's far too many bang average fighters trying to run the house here. And quite frankly, on this issue, I'm starting to go on the Dana White side on this. I'm fed up with people using this issue as an excuse to try and get pay better pay when you are not willing to go out and risk it all. And I'm fed up with people like Jake Paul trying to be a champion of something that they're not and that they do not care about. Let's be, per for anybody who's under any disillusion, like I don't care if you're a 12 year old fan of Jake, I don't care if you're a 40 year old man, let's make something extremely clear here. And I'm going to make it clear for you right now. Jake Paul cares about Jake Paul. Jake Paul makes his money off of the gullibility of his fans and people who are too stupid to know the difference. Do not, this guy's a con artist. Don't believe him. He does not care about the fighters who have to set up GoFundMe's to go and fight. He doesn't care about the people who are injured. He does not care about the prelim fighters. If you think he does, you are wrong and you are delusional and you are gullible. For the love of God, screw your head on and do some research and see the sense. Dana White Again, far from perfect, never going to defend him fully. Let me make that clear so that people don't take this out of context. But the guys who show up and the guys who show out get paid. Israel Adesanya, living in Auckland, New Zealand, drives a McLaren. Conor McGregor has whatever kinds of yachts he has. I don't know. I don't care. Yeah, whatever. Lamborghini. Yeah. Lamborghini. Yeah. Lamborghini, Lamborghini yacht, yeah. whatever it is. Um, the point that I'm making here, though, is... The, the guys who show up, the guys who put in the work, the guys who get finishes, the guys who stay off social media, the guys putting in work in the dark hours, these are the guys getting the money that you want. You are not entitled to it just because you're in the UFC and you are not entitled to it just because you scream and shout and kick a bite like a little kid. If you want the Conor McGregor money, follow the Conor McGregor example, grind, graft and rise to the top. Hey, yeah, no, I agree with you, and I think that's a good point. I'm fed up of it. I am. I, but I, 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 I'm, I, I'm on your side, and I agree with you. But I think not everyone is asking for superstar level money. I think if you are a prelim fighter and you're in the UFC, you are in the main place, you know, the main competition, MMA competition in the world. 
if you are going to develop your craft like Connor did, not everyone can completely abandon their financial situation to put the hours in the dark arts, especially if you're having to manage two jobs at the same time to be able to. Connor did. Yeah, but like Connor, like the, he, not everyone the, is able to. The UFC to do didn't that. have the money back then to fund Connor how much he wanted to. Now they have a lot more money. Exactly. And Dana yeah. White's keeping a lot more than he, he needs to, I feel like. I have an well, example. I, that's neither here nor there. That's not the topic, so I'm not going to expand yeah. on that. No, exactly. I, exactly. I'm just, yeah, that, that's true. This is a whole other conversation for a whole other day. But whenever I was covering Bellator a couple weeks ago, uh, we interviewed this guy named Ty Gorger, who is a Hawaiian guy uh, training out of uh, Los Angeles, who, who fought on um, on uh, the, the first fight in the main card, right? Now, Ty is, is an up-and-coming fighter or whatever, but he lost, and he's not really, you know, he's not a, a superstar-level uh, Bellator guy or anything, really, at all. He is making more money than his his girl that is in the UFC and ranked. Now, I'm not going to say their names or whatever and how much they're making, but that is kind of a sign, and I really think that if you are in the UFC, you should be making, I don't know, like, I'm not saying, like, $300,000. I'm just saying, like, enough to where you actually are making a profit out of it and actually t- able to take care of your family if you are doing that, able to make a career out of it, especially if you are good. And if, Now, Keelan, your point about people bringing it to a, a decision and then requesting stuff like that, that is extremely valid because how many times have we been on guys like Alexander Rockich who are content to kind of just sit back and not really do anything? I completely agree with you there. But especially for the prelim people, I think just give them like a base pay of something where they can actually bring some back and, 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 and start to develop further. Uh, but yeah, that's a whole other conversation for a whole other yeah, the thing. Prelim, the prelim guys, I agree with, I'm not saying anybody who's on the early prelims should just be left to their own devices. Yeah. That, that's not yeah. where I'm going with this. I'm saying anybody who's on like high prelims or main card, like for, just as an example, Jared Cannonier, right. Got a decision over Calvin Gastelum when there's an argument, he could have pushed the pace and finished the fight you know, got what like one or two hundred thousand dollars. I can't remember how much it was. Then claimed he was broke. You know, I mean, quite frankly, I think he's only fought like once or twice in two years, and he has two houses. Yeah. So you know, there's a lot of fighters living beyond their means as well. If we're being totally honest, too. You know, I'm not saying dump everybody in the wayside and let Dana White rule as a tyrant king because that's absolutely wrong. But we've got to try and keep hunger and motivation as well to get the best fighters fighting the best. Why do you think boxing's ruined? Why do you think Jake Paul's over there taking control of it? Because money has flooded these people and destroyed their hunger and their appetite. And now no one wants to fight the best anymore. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right about that. It's a very difficult balance to find. But it's a balance that has to be found. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. I'm just like more more the people that are still trying to work to come up is where I'm like, yeah, okay, they shouldn't, I agree with. they shouldn't be getting paid like fifteen thousand dollars to fight because that's like you're not you're not making it with taxes and everything. That's a whole other conversation. But let's go ahead and move on to the next scheduled topic on today. Kevin Lee lost to Daniel Rodriguez. Lorenzo, what did you make of this? What do you think is next for Kevin Lee? Well, uh, man, well, I thought Kevin Lee actually looked good coming into the fight. You know, I thought he looked a little bigger. You know, I thought he um, was acclimating to 170 a little better. But at the end of the day, I just he's just not a welterweight. You know what I mean? I think he's a talented guy. He's young. You know, he has all the tools it takes to be successful. But, you know, he he got in there with the killer, man. And it was just too much for him. You know, he had a he had a little bit of success at the end of the round with the takedown and some ground and pound. But in round two and three, it's like Rodriguez just battered him, man. I mean, just just not a one welterweight, you know? So, yeah, no, I, Kevin Lee's young. Let's be honest. Yeah. I think he, he has plenty of time to develop in the UFC. They kind of sent him into stardom really fast. And uh, now he's kind of, he's paying for those repercussions because he doesn't know what kind of fighter he is yet, you know? And yeah. that's, exactly. this isn't the end of you, of Kevin Lee, no. my car. I think Kevin Lee, we've said it before, I think on last week's podcast, Kevin Lee has everything it takes to, to become a champion. He has got such great talent. And when it comes to, wrestling and he has great stand-up he just doesn't have a fight iq yet and that'll come with time so uh, yeah, yeah. i think he just has to go back to the drawing board find a good opponent for himself maybe a big name i i think mike perry would be a fun fight between the two both are coming off of losses and it's not just like one loss it's like two or three losses in a row so um i think that would be a fun fight uh kevin lee is a fantastic fighter and he always will be uh so i think hopefully next time we see him in the octagon he will have his stuff put together because i mean 
he looked good on the ground when he was wrestling yeah. and his strikes could have been better, but he wasn't by far a bad fighter in that fight last or no. last weekend. You know, he was, he was doing what he had to do. He had the game plan. He tried ensuing it. It worked in the first round and he couldn't adapt in the second and third. What he yeah. needs to learn is to how to, how to adapt to his, uh, his opponents. And once he learns that boom, the, the, the road is clear ahead for him. I think he's got a good, he's got a good chance of becoming a really high ranked fighter. I think a uh, move back down to lightweight wouldn't be a bad idea. I don't want I honestly, it doesn't matter what weight division he is for me right now. He just needs to find his footing in his fighting style. Yeah. He, he needs to, I feel like he just needs to, he just needs to get some momentum going. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's been a while since the momentum was in his favor, you know, yeah. like he's, he's fallen on hard times a little bit, but I know, you know, he's got some good wins under his belt. You know, he's yeah. fought a lot of high level guys, you know, you can't really take anything away from him. So. Yeah. Nothing but facts from Lorenzo and Hunter there. Um, the Kevin Lee conundrum continues. It really does. Um, you know, it's to me, Kevin Lee is like a 155, 170 Kelvin Gastelum. And yeah, then no yeah, matter like what that. division he goes in, he just cannot get it going. It, it's literally like he's stuck in the mud. You know, every time he goes down to 155, you know, well, no matter what division Kevin Lee's in, right? Kevin Lee's at a certain standard, okay? He's sort of in between the gray area between a grade C and a grade B. And he generally tends to do really good there. But whenever he tries to step up from high C to low B, he just he just can't get it going. He gets mm-hmm. one win, he gets battered the next. He goes back down, wins, battered. You can see the pattern that's going on here. And realistically, Kevin Lee's going around in circles at the moment. And it's not something I want to see because... Arrogance aside, Kevin Lee is a bloody good fighter. He is naturally gifted. Like Lorenzo and Hunter said, his wrestling is really, really good. But he just has no consistency at all at the moment, both largely in the octagon. You know, every time he finds difficulty at 155, he runs up to 170. Every time he runs into trouble at 170, he runs back down to 155. I actually could not have said it much better than Lorenzo did. He needs to pick a division and he needs to stick on it until he gets consistency and until he can get himself driving forward again. Um, I, you know, I've seen people saying that Kevin Lee just isn't good enough and that he doesn't have the talent. That I really don't know about. I think that's a tad unfair. But at the same time, you do kind of have to wonder if he can't beat guys, and Daniel Rodriguez is a really, really good fighter, amazing one for him. But if you can't beat a Daniel Rodriguez, how are you going to beat anyone in the top 10 at welterweight, top 15, even leading into unranked? And it's the same story at lightweight, you know, got a vicious head kick knockout over Gregor Gillespie, and then got absolutely pulverized by Rafael Dos Anjos, and then got pulverized again by Charles Oliveira. It, there's, there's too much to Kevin Lee to break down right now. I think he's got the talent to do it. I absolutely believe he has the physical gift and the attributes to do it. But you kind of have to wonder what standard Kevin Lee's at right now. And we've got to be honest, there's no point in lying about this. Is Kevin Lee an elite caliber fighter? Because realistically, that's where everybody's targeting. And could we say truthfully, if we put Kevin Lee against anybody in the top 10 at welterweight or lightweight right now, that he'd have a chance? I'm leaning towards being not so sure about that. If he's fully rolling and if he's on his momentum, maybe. But even against Tony Ferguson for the interim lightweight title a few years ago, really good wrestling, got caught in a triangle and choked, had the life nearly choked out of him. At this point, Kevin Lee really, really needs to get his head together. He's got to figure out where he's at and he has to get some momentum rolling in his next fight. Or for me, he's in trouble. No, yeah, I, I agree with you guys. I mean, you guys all pretty much nailed it. The thing is with Kevin Lee, it's such he's such an interesting fighter because he it's like just the Kelvin Gastelum comparison is perfect because he doesn't really fit in anywhere. Um, he his best moment was whenever he was surging at lightweight, fought Tony Ferguson for the interim belt. Then after that, it's just been inconsistency. That's the only word you can say about Kevin Lee after that fight. He's had some phenomenal performances. But then he's had some losses where it's like, okay, I really don't know what his he's going to look like in the future. I almost feel kind of bad for Kevin Lee in this fight because it was built up to where he should have won. But this fight was almost setting him up to fail, I think. Daniel Rodriguez is a guy that no one's talking about, but just knocked out Mike Perry, knocked out another guy on a three-fight win streak, 
just he's really big for welterweight as well. Kevin Lee moving up from 155 to 170. You know, he's not a small welterweight by any means, but Daniel Rodriguez is a big welterweight and has some real power. I mean, Kevin Lee got rocked and survived. He's very good at re- recovery, especially on the feet, which was great to see, um, which is why I do think there is hope for Kevin Lee. And he looked good, especially on the ground, but he just gets too comfortable in the stand-up and he gets too comfortable on the ground. He almost doesn't really mix it up very well. He chooses one thing to do one round and then another thing to do the next round. Very and black pre- and white. Exactly. And that gets predictable. Daniel Rodriguez picked up on that. And Daniel Rodriguez doesn't even have one of the best fight IQs of welterweight. That's one of the problems with, with what Kevin Lee is at. The two divisions where he fights at are two of the most stacked divisions in the entire UFC as well. Everybody's like, oh, where does Kevin Lee fit in? But where does he legitimately fit in here? I mean, 155 is ridiculously, ridiculously stacked. And then 170, you could say, is probably the best one of the best divisions in the entire UFC right now. I mean, yeah. top to bottom. It's just he's not going to catch a break. And where he is going to be fighting is going to be at that top 10 caliber. That's where he's aiming for. That's where he wants to fight. Just like Keelan said, that's everybody's goal, but especially Kevin Lee, who has the name. And I agree with you. I don't know who he can beat in the welterweight division right now. I think he, I think he really needs to get his mindset right. And I think, personally, I think it's urgency for Kevin Lee because I think if he loses his next fight, he will be cut from the UFC. Yeah. That's where I stand right now especially with everything that's, you know, he's, he's on a couple of fights, losing and everything. I think it's an absolute must win for Kevin Lee in his next fight. And then after that, it's about building consistency. But his next fight, no matter who it's against, he absolutely has to win. Uh, and that's that's kind of what I'm thinking about Kevin Lee right now. Yeah. Hey, absolutely. Well, Lorenzo, thank you so much for coming on today. Great podcast. I mean, we had some phenomenal back and forth and everything going on. As always, make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. You can listen to us everywhere, literally everywhere, including iTunes and Spotify. Follow us on Instagram at MMA.Island and check out our website, MMAIsland.net. Also, check out all of Lorenzo's work, also literally everywhere. Anywhere you can listen to music, everything, go check that out. Big shout out to Lorenzo. Thanks, guys. Appreciate me. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate y'all. And a big shout out to our sponsor real quick, BetUS. If you're going to bet, bet through them. Lorenzo, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it.